Brooklyn Independent Television. Coming up on Brooklyn Review. Bad news for your pockets if you like beer. I'm Melissa Rose Cooper and coming up, I'll tell you why. The battle between businesses and a local food cart owner in Bay Ridge may have come to a close. But is the controversy really over or is it simply the calm before the storm? I'm Sherry Carabin and coming up on Brooklyn Review, I'll have that story. This is running a tour with Brooklyn Review and we dive deeper into the shark fin soup controversy. We'll have these stories and more next. Welcome to Brooklyn Review. I'm Brian Vines. In Bay Ridge, an old battle is getting worse as a group of Fifth Avenue business owners continue to fight the rid the business district of food carts. The organizer of the Save Our Streets campaign says the carts are operating illegally and cutting into the profits of many of the area's businesses. As Sherry Carabin reports, things may have calmed down, but they're far from over. A peaceful scene on this Sunday afternoon along 86th Street and Bay Ridge. But beneath the surface, a battle continues to brew between those who run these two food carts and several Fifth Avenue business owners who say the rules of the Business Improvement District prohibit the carts. They're sitting there like pirates in the middle of the night operating in a bid that has no vending allowed, you know, and it's not fair. We've been there for four years. Nobody's ever told me they had a problem with me. They're trying to imply like I'm a criminal in these streets, that it's because I'm trying to make a living, I'm wrong. That's Sammy Kaysen. He manages Middle Eastern halal food, the cart that has experienced the most problems. Kaysen says each time he moves the cart to clean it, opponents set up new obstacles to keep him from returning. First, he says, they installed these benches. When that didn't work, he says protesters, led by the owner of the Lone Star Bar and Grill, stepped up the fight. We came, you know, to come bring our car back like, hey, like how we've been doing for the last four years, and we saw a table here with uh, some of the store owners and the owner of the Lone Star Bar on the bench um, telling us, you know, we're trying to clean our streets and we don't need these food vendors to destroy them. It went for a couple of days and we got our point across and now the city is uh, enacting a rule that Mayor Giuliani made years ago to have a review panel review this avenue and put us on the no vendor food zone list, which is what we want. Because even though we're on a no vendor zone list, it doesn't say food next to it. So what happened was, is years ago when they made that list up, food wasn't an issue. Councilman Vincent Gentili's office has confirmed that the New York City Department of Small Business Services is reviewing the situation. However, a spokesman for the councilman could not say what the outcome would be. The councilman is co-sponsoring legislation that would require mobile food vendors to display letter grades similar to the ones posted in restaurants perhaps helping to address another concern of business owners who feel the carts have an unfair advantage. All the um, uh, business owners on the, on the block feel that it's unfair that we have to pay six, seven thousand dollars a month rent just to be here and we're all struggling to survive and they're not paying really, what are they paying? We, we really don't know. There's nothing wrong with competition. I like to call it fair competition. It has to be fair. I pay my rightful amount of taxes. We pay our permits. We pay the rent for the commissary, the rent for parking. We pay our bills. They say we don't have utility bills. What keeps this car operating? They make it sound like we have no bills. We don't pay employees. I don't understand. Come work in a car and tell me how it is. It's a 24-7 job, honestly. What do you think a fair solution to the problem might be? Well, if, if they don't have to pay rent like the rest of us, then maybe they should just give something to the Business Improvement District of 86th Street. It's called the bid. We all pay our dues as building owners and business owners. That that might help some of the other business owners here um, be a little happier about it. The food carts do have their supporters. I don't know why this guy is fighting them. I have no idea why they beacon on them. I have no idea why. Because he has his own place. They don't bother anybody. They're just making a living their families like everybody else. You want to take one at a time. You want to get rid of this guy first and then 
That one. I think the storefront people have their points, and I think he's also, um, he has the right to sell food outside on a cart if people are going to buy from him. I think there's enough room for everyone. Some in the neighborhood, including Kaysen, are even questioning the true motives of opponents. They don't bother anyone. I think, you know, this is, these are the only two carts, I think, in all of Bay Ridge. And this is a, the shopping district, and I do think it's a racial issue. I do. Allegations that business owners deny. It's really nothing about race at all. It's a great neighborhood. Everyone gets along fine. It's, it's not about competition for me. They don't take away from my food business. They do take away from the stores across the street. They do take away from the local uh, Chinese restaurants. It's not fair that you could just come here, set your cart up, sell your food, not answer to anybody, not pay the dues that we pay to the bid, not pay for garbage pickup, leave all the garbage on the street. We're not allowed to do that. If you had a problem with me, you could have came up to me like a human being and, you know, discussed it with me. And I'm not an animal. I'm not going to bite you. You can come and tell me, look, we feel that A, B, C, and D. It's just not right. There's criminals in the street. There's drug dealers. Why aren't we looking for them? Why aren't we coming together to save the streets from them? Why are we trying to reduce jobs? In an effort to address concerns that he's not doing his fair share, Kaysen recently announced plans to make a financial contribution that would go toward the improvement of Bay Ridge. While he is willing to work with business owners, Kaysen says he isn't leaving and plans to stand up for his rights as well as those of other vendors. I feel like we have the right to be here. We pay our bills, we pay our taxes, so why should we move? So I believe, you know, we should stand strong and do what I do every day, um, work and hope for the best. Reporting from Bay Ridge, this is Sherry Carabin for Brooklyn Review. For many Brooklynites over 21, hot summer calls for cold beer. But as temps continue to rise, so does the price of locally brewed beer. Melissa Rose Cooper tells us how new legislation is causing local breweries to tap your beer budget. That beer you look forward to slurping down after a long day could soon cost you a bit extra. After more than a decade, the New York State Supreme Court recently put an end to tax and fee exemptions for in-state brewers. There was no heads up, there was no kind of warning, it just kind of came out of nowhere and a big chunk of the fees that we're now supposed to pay are retroactive. And that's not particularly fair. The ruling is a result of a lawsuit from a Massachusetts beer distributor and states that such exemptions are unconstitutional. Just for my brand, it's going to be about $25,000 a year in extra taxations. The loss of the tax breaks is especially devastating to Brooklyn, which once ruled the nation's beer industry. There was a huge German population here that opened many, many breweries in the uh, 19th century. By 1900, there are 48 breweries in Brooklyn, and as late as 1960, Brooklyn's making 10% of the beer in the United States. They asked for Rheingold extra dry before and after dark. We had two of the largest breweries in the country right here in Brooklyn, uh, Rheingold and Schaefer. By the mid-1970s, the older breweries died out. They didn't have the technology to ship beer across the country. They didn't have refrigeration, they didn't have canning, they didn't have cars or trucks. And so beer was local. And so if you drank beer in Brooklyn in the 1860s and 70s, odds are you drank the beer made in Brooklyn. Kelso of Brooklyn is one of three breweries still existent in the borough. It's already feeling the pain of the tap and adjusted prices to help swallow the extra costs. It started immediately because the taxes were due actually retroactively to when the decision was made, uh, which was in the end of March, but most brewers didn't hear about it until the middle of April, so we were already three weeks behind. I'm going to raise my prices to the distributor, the distrib distributor is going to raise their prices to the, the bar owner and the retailer, the retailer of course at that point is going to raise their prices, so it's just going to kind of be more expensive beer for everybody. But this isn't the first time beer has faced taxes. Beer and taxes go way back. A lot of people don't know this, but the U.S. government for a long time was funded primarily through beer and liquor taxes. They imposed the first taxes on beer and liquor during the Civil War to help the country pay for the war. And there's been beer and taxes on them ever since. 
Not only did the new fees cause Kelso's Bear to go up, it's also changing its plans to expand. There's a state excise tax and a city excise tax. So doing business in the city immediately became more expensive than doing business out of the city. I've got expansion plans that I've been planning over the last two years that involved growing within New York City. Now I'm kind of stepping back and thinking, well, maybe I, maybe I should grow just outside of New York City if it's gonna, co it's gonna save me thousands, tens of thousands of dollars a year in, in taxes that I didn't have to pay uh, a month ago. The New York State Brewers Association is urging the state to reconsider the end of the tax exemption. But for now, local breweries will continue to do what they do best, make great beer. For Brooklyn Review, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. In many Asian cultures, shark fin soup is a staple of a celebratory dinner. The soup is expensive, but sharks may be the one paying the price. As the Asian population expands in New York, so does the demand for shark fin soup. Now some elected officials and wildlife advocates want to pull this delicacy from local menus. Reporter Rana Natur tells us why. Shark fin soup is an Asian delicacy traditionally served at formal events like weddings and birthday celebrations. A new bill may ban shark fins in New York by next year. Opponents argue it's a long-standing cultural tradition, while supporters like Michael Skoletsky say the environmental toll is much too high. Sharks are being emptied out of the oceans uh, over the last couple of decades. They're being overfished and they're primarily being overfished because their fins are very valuable. We partnered with Wild Aid in China uh, with their spokesperson Yao Ming and we produced this fabulous commercial. What if you could see how shark fin soup is made? A third of all shark species are nearly extinct, but we can help save them. When the buying stops, the killing can too. My name is Kian Lam Ko, and I'm a food blogger and also a chef. I created these recipes uh, basically to uh, uh, allow people to have alternative of have, consuming a, a real shark's fin soup, um, since basically the main characteristic of eating shark's fin soup is the texture. Um, I used this ingredient called um, uh, konyaku, which is a, a Japanese uh, uh, product. It's a, um, it's a curd um, starch of a uh, Japanese yam, and the texture is very similar. It has, it has, a, it has a, a chewy texture. It has a, a rather transparent uh, collagen-like uh, quality to it. So I think it's a very suitable ingredient to use for um, replacing the shark's fin, in, uh, the ingredient itself. Uh, New York, compared to Hong Kong and China, do not consume as much um, shark's fins uh, as like, you know, the, the population in, a in China. But I think it's important as a, as, a, as a stand that we start here and spread the message. We went to the streets of Sunset Park and many people we spoke to had not heard of this bill. Did you hear about the shark fin ban that's going through New York? No. Okay. Yeah. To most people, it really is not a big issue at this point, so this is why I think it's important to uh, create awareness. We are serious about uh, protecting the sharks. This bill has to move forward, and it's only going to move forward if people like you and me speak to our assembly members and our senators and say, please pass the shark fin bill. Brooklyn real estate is hot and high priced. But there is a process that secures vacant land space to local communities for free. Julia Vassia has learned how one organization is helping residents use the open space to make Brooklyn neighborhoods cleaner and greener. This man digs the idea that these rocks and hills will soon turn into a nice garden. We were trying to acquire a lot and we found out that it didn't belong to anyone. It's our land that's been in our neighborhood for so long and now everyone in the community wants to help out. So we all kind of all got together via email and all of a sudden now we have this group. Here in bed people use their hands, put their own time and money to beautify the neighborhood they live in. I spent lots of my own money. My husband would kill me. But I had people come and help me with the landscaping and I paid people to help me, you know, get the bottles and things that get thrown into the garden by the people that play basketball, baseball, whatever over there. How much did you spend? I spent about six hundred dollars. This is this is what it looked like the day that we opened. It looked 
basically like that. Broken fence, some garbage, things like that. This lot had been empty since the 70s, but last November Kristen got the key to this fence. She and her friends spent the whole winter working on the site, and now... There's squash over there, there are some tomatoes, there are blueberries, eggplant, potato, parsley, onion, I think that's kale over there. I think there's some cucumber at the front, it's a little bit of everything. Brooklyn has almost 600 acres of unused public land, according to city data. It's more than a thousand empty lots. And if you come across a poster on the fence that says, you have found a lot of your life, it means the piece of land is empty and your local community might be able to use it for free. Paula walks people through legal hurdles of renting the spots from the government agencies. If there's a vacant lot in your neighborhood and it's publicly owned and you want to know why, we'll tell you who to call in the city. There's a lot of competition for space in New York City. Um, a lot of the lots we work on are held by Housing Preservation and Development and have been some of them for 50 years. When the city agency decides to actually implement the project that they acquired the land for, um, the communities have agreed that they will give up their rights. Um, but, in some, but that seems like, yes, it, it'll probably happen at some point, but it might not happen in this generation. She opened a company called 596 Acres. It helped kickstart a social network. On this website, the borough's community members share news about okay. the lot's ownership and ongoing projects, be it a garden, a farm, or an open-air theater. The app takes city data regarding um, publicly owned vacant land in the city and lets people search for that kind of land near them. If you type in, say, your zip code, you can zoom in to where you live and you can see other vacant lots nearby. And here you can see a bunch of people are organizing there. And you can email one of them directly. But while bringing community members closer to their dreams, 596 Acres may soon have to give up its own. We are trying to figure out how to make this project sustainable. At the moment, um, it's a mostly volunteer effort. I am not getting paid at the moment but my student loans will come due in October. And if we haven't figured out how to make this something that is sustainable, then kind of the human resources part of this project will close. It'll be a website, Okay. Um, which will be a bummer. Yet, it seems that the seeds have already been planted in the hearts of these Brooklynites who want the city to look better. All these empty lots all over the place. The city's doing nothing with them. We have to look at them, they are eyesore, they are open an area for dumping. So why not make it something beautiful? Something that we can look out our windows and see and it's nice. Something that we can use for something. For Brooklyn Review, this is Julia Vassi. Okay, Brooklyn, have you voted yet? Not Obama Romney, but for your favorite historic site in Brooklyn. It's all part of an online competition to help some treasured Brooklyn locations weather the test of time a little bit brighter for a little while longer. Brooklyn Review met the program's funders who recently paid a visit to two of Brooklyn's top grant contenders. Hi, how are you? Good. Great to see you. Yeah, Thanks for welcoming too. me here. Oh, I'm excited about it. American Express created the Partners in Preservation program with the National Trust for Historic Preservation about six years ago. Um, as a way of engaging the public in historic preservation and the cause of historic preservation, if you will, and also getting them more familiar with the historic places in their own neighborhoods. So we figured that the best way to engage people in the cause of historic preservation was to allow them to vote on money, on giving away money. Uh, so we set up a fund uh, and we allow the public to vote for their favorite historic sites and then we award grants on the basis of that vote. What we're looking at here is the spine uh, of a design that resembles an open book. So the two flaps of the book uh, flank Eastern Parkway and Flatbush Avenue. Um, and the shape of these doors um, kind of follows Grand Army Plaza. Um, so in terms of our project, the restoration um, will cover this area. But this whole portico is really important 
um, for a couple of reasons for the library. Uh, it represents kind of access to knowledge and information. If you look at the inscriptions and um, some of the figurines up here, we have you know representation of Moby Dick and Walt Whitman and the Raven. So there's a real kind of feeling of entering into this building, which is a gateway to access and no of knowledge and information. We started with about 500 sites that would be eligible uh, to participate in the program. So these are historic sites that are landmarked organizations or that are part of the National Registry, cultural institutions, but they needed to have a restoration project that was ready to begin. The social media aspect has given us a way to reach an entirely new audience in a new way. Um, I think that's one of the big takeaways from us uh, from a marketing perspective. Um, you know, I think this is the type of thing where we're not only raising awareness for our organization, but for a broader cause, which is preservation and historic uh, landmarks. So yeah, I think we would definitely get involved again. You know, it definitely raises awareness of what these organizations are doing. A great example is since we launched the program, we've been hearing from our sites that the web traffic going to their websites has just, you know, increased, you know, incredibly. They never expected it. Preservationists are really skewing younger than I think most people may have initially thought. You know, it's something that I think people really care about. These are their communities. These are the buildings that create culture. And I think that that interest in preserving buildings is skewing a little bit younger and I hope that it continues that way. We have nothing but love for the Brooklyn Public Library. I myself am an avid reader of books and frequenter of libraries. Um, and it goes without saying that Brooklyn Public Library is a, an incredibly important historic institution in its own right. We feel though that what we can offer here in this space with the restoration of our stained glass in the interior of our sanctuary can provide not only a space for gathering and for a meeting of the minds in the same way that a library can, but also a space for prayer. You're seeing a hundred year old structure that looks it, that has not received a lot of the kind of necessary upkeep and maintenance that it's deserved uh, in the last 50 years or so. And as a result, a lot of this precious original stained glass has been damaged just by weather and, and acts of God, if you will. They're handing them out to as many people as possible, and it lists all the ways that people can help us win the funds from Partners in Preservation and American Express to repair the stained glass windows in our sanctuary. We list here the Partners in Preservation website, we list our own personal website, our CBE Connects website, and also our Facebook page. What we hope, together with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, is to engage people in the cause of historic preservation and to get them to recognize that there are historic sites in their neighborhoods and that those historic sites need money. They need money, they need attention, uh, they need media attention, uh, they need visitors, they need donors. And what we've found by doing this project in other cities is that voters turn into visitors and visitors t turn into members and members turn into donors. Uh, and that's exactly what these institutions need. This is terrific. Yeah, All right. let's go in. All right, great, terrific. May is Asian American Heritage Month. And in Brooklyn, that means a street festival, which draws thousands to Dumbo in celebration of Asia's rich culture, history, and beauty. of the Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Festival. We've been around for 33 years, and what's amazing about this festival is that we have up to 10,000 people that come out to celebrate Asian American identity and Pacific Islander heritage. Well, the reason why Brooklyn's an amazing place is because the Asian American community in this community has grown by 80% over the last five years. I mean, it's a tremendous growth. So when we have young immigrants that come to this country and their kids grow up in this country that are looking to connect with their roots, this is the only place that they can get it in the city. 
You know, like the great thing about America is it's called the great, mul uh, the great melting pot, right? And you can kind of get the feel of it, but you don't get, you know, the the gist of it, the heart of it, uh, because you know much of, uh, you know, much of experience is amplified when you get to have a shared experience in an outdoor event like this. Exposure here is amazing. There's so many people, people of different cultures. I mean, we just had a Bollywood dance and some Chinese festival dances. I think it's good because this is a way to show uh, other people outside of Asian um, that our culture is a very beautiful one. And I'm very proud to be a Filipino. I'm actually Filipino. pretty much uh, encompasses all of East Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, and all the surrounding areas. So everything from Pakistan to China to Japan to Korea, down to Cambodia, the Philippines, and the Samoan Islands. Four hundred volunteers that like, you know, came from the day of, that are involved in some way in the production. That shared experience is incredible. Well, that brings this Brooklyn Review to a close. If you missed anything or you just got to see it again, visit us at our home on the web at brickartsmedia.org. We're also on Facebook, iTunes, Twitter, Blip TV. You name it, we're probably there. So we'll see you next time. Bye now. Watch this and other Brooklyn Independent Television episodes online at brickartsmedia.org slash BIT.